It's my pleasure to uh, share this time with our amazing archivist, Lisa Lobdell. Lisa is um, the curator and the uh, person who preserves and organizes all of this. And all of this is extraordinary, but you have chosen some specific things. Well, Michael, I've pulled some scrapbooks from some of our collections. This one right in front of us came from Ray Charles. And we have uh, one from Dick Voy now over here, who was in the Wolverine Orchestra. Harry Ravel, and that one over there, that big one, is uh, Meredith Wilson's first Music Man scrapbook. He has three or four, I think, in his collection. Um, I love looking at scrapbooks. They're, they're such a um, little snapshot of what people find important in their day-to-day -day lives. And when public history, the field of public history, was in its infancy back in the 1970s, um, professors at Indiana University commissioned a huge study, a nationwide study, to figure out how the average person used history. And what they found after interviewing, I don't know, 30,000 people across the country, was that people use history to tell their own stories for posterity, which seems kind of an easy answer, but I guess they had to start somewhere. <laughs> so here we are, we've got Ray Charles scrapbook, and this is actually, it looks like a reunion of the Ray Charles singers. And there were several groups of Ray Charles singers, if I understand it correctly, that were often touring or recording. And in 2006, they got together for a reunion. Um, so there's pictures Old pictures here of Perry Como and the various singers performing on stage and in the recording sessions um, and just uh, a variety of things. So I would imagine they may have created a scrapbook, scrapbook like this for everybody that attended um, at the time. So there's that one. The one, pardon me, go ahead. I, I just am curious about what for example, you've learned about Ray Charles, not having known him, but you are very intimately connected to all of these artifacts of his life. Yeah. So. Um, I have uh, watched his memorial service, and in reading through a lot of his papers, um, well, he loved music, obviously, but he loved people as well, and it seems like the relationship between he and Perry Como were very close. Um, and his kids have told wonderful stories. Um, you know, he just loved being around people, and he always, um, he always had tickets to go somewhere. And I know that um, after his wife passed away, um, he continued to buy tickets to shows, and he would call somebody up that he hadn't seen in a while and say, hey, why don't you come see this concert with me? And um, his daughter-in-law said that um, Ray, uh, the, became sick very suddenly and passed away, but he still had tickets when they um, were cleaning out his house. He was still planning for the future, expecting um, good things to happen. So am I close? You knew him. <laughs> well, no, I, uh, uh, it's not about being close. Yeah. It's just uh, you gleaned. It's just interesting how everything tells a story, and that was exactly. the point. Exactly, yeah. And, and so you know things about Ray that I don't know oh. be because of... Uh, being immersed in all of this material. Mm -hmm. It's like I was with Ira Gershwin one day and we had an argument about a date that something happened and he was insistent that he was correct and I finally found some artifact in his house and said, well, see, this proves it. He said, well, you have an advantage over me. And I said, what is that? He said, well, I've only lived my life, but you've thoroughly researched it. <laughs> so that's, 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 what, true. that's what comes from these things. That's true. And uh, for those of you who don't know the name Ray Charles of, of the uh, choral arranger and uh, composer, uh, he worked extensively on television uh, with Perry Como and on all the different variety shows and I worked with him a number of times through the years and he was one of the most important choral directors of American popular music and so his life touched mm -hmm. um, practically every major entertainer in show business over a 60, 70 year period because Ray lived into his 90s and so these scrapbooks reflect a broader history of American popular music filtered through the life of one man. Mm -hmm. A really great man. So let's move on to Harry Ravel. Sure. You know more about Harry Ravel than I do. So. 
Harry Ravel, a name that many of you probably don't know, but he wrote a lot of uh, very important American popular songs. And this is one of a number of scrapbooks that came from his nephew, Billy. And uh, most of these scrapbooks document um, a later period in his life. Some of the earlier ones were, were kept uh, back, but we're hoping that we will obtain them. But Harry Ravel's most prominent collaborator was Mac Gordon, who uh, is pictured here, who was a guy who weighed, what, what would you say, Lisa, what, 300-some pounds? I mean, Probably. He was like three, uh, he, he was a, a massive guy, and uh, he was Harry's most frequent collaborator. And these scrapbooks are wonderful because they're all original photographs that uh, chronicle so much of Harry's professional life and also his personal life. He had all these parties, like there's a photo here where he's dressed up in some kind of gaucho outfit and there's somebody doing a Groucho Marx uh, impression mm -hmm. as Captain Spaulding next to him. And so clearly this was a man who loved to have parties and loved to celebrate uh, his career and such. And yet, they're so confounding because there are photographs of people uh, whom we don't know, who, whom we don't know. We don't know who they are. Like this guy, he's in a zillion of these photographs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who he is. I've sent the picture to many people. Nobody knows. So one of the things that we love about having this material is that when it's posted, when it's sent out there, somebody will fill in the gap. Somebody will identify who these people are. And uh, Harry Ravel was a very interesting guy because uh, he worked in England. He was one of the first songwriters who was loaned overseas to another film studio because he had had such massive success. The studio made a deal to loan out uh, uh, Mac Gordon and Harry Ravel to the British studios for an amount of money that was equivalent to the money they would get for loaning out a big star. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very bankable commodity. And he also was gay. He was very, uh, very repressed and, and um, uh, closeted. And uh, uh, so he had to live a life that uh, was very secretive in that if he had uh, revealed his personal life, he probably wouldn't have got the, gotten the employment that he had. And so he suppressed a part of his personal life for the sake of his love of music and for his career. And I believe we have what? How many scrapbooks do we have? I forget. It was a whole... Eight, I, I believe. Eight, eight scrapbooks. There, so there's eight scrapbooks that, that um, are one of the most comprehensive documents I've seen of a songwriter's mm -hmm. career photographically. So these are, these are quite wonderful. And I don't know who she is either. Oh, well. <laughs> Okay, then let's take a look at the music band next. Ah, well. Scrapbook number one. Yes, it says music man number one. Well, one of the things that's fun about this is that you open it up, and the first thing that you see on the left here is a piece of manuscript music paper with one, two, three, four, five, six bars, presumably in the hand of Meredith Wilson, mm -hmm. And above it, written in ink with an exclamation point, it says, the beginning. And it's just a lead sheet. It's just a single melody line in the key of C. And what do you think it is? Do you know what it is? I'm going to guess 76 trombones. Yep. Da, 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 And it stops. But that's the beginning. That's where it all started. And speak about this, if you will. Sure. Um, what does that say there? This is the first program of the Music Man premiere performance at the Majestic Theater. And this is the playbill in gold, no less. With cigarette ads. With cigarette ads <laughs> and alcohol ads. Um, Yay, I love the old days. Of the first performance <laughs> of the Music Man. Um, so we have that wonderful little piece of piece of memorabilia there. Um, we've got audition schedules and of course news clippings. You can't hardly have a scrapbook about something like this without the news clippings and we have to be very careful. We've begun digitizing these but we still want to be careful with how we handle them. Here's a Hirschfeld cartoon. 
Yes, and with scrapbooks, things fall out. Mm -hmm. You know, things become detached. For example, you can see uh, uh, here, this was probably here. Probably there. And something was here. Mm -hmm. And so they have to be handled so carefully. Mm -hmm. And talk about, uh, as an archivist, how you handle these things. Carefully. Um, Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, as you can see, I'm not wearing gloves. Um, people often think that we wear cotton gloves uh, all of the time. But when you're handling paper, especially if something as fragile as this, you want to be able to feel what you're touching. And so you start with clean hands um, and work from there. You want to handle the papers. As you can see, I'm, I'm not just grabbing the edge and flipping it over. I'm holding it like this. Um, we start digitizing things. Often, um, rather than lose a news clipping, we'll make a copy of it um, because newspaper is incredibly brittle. It's very high in acid um, and it breaks down and, and if it's next to other materials, it will begin to break those down as well. So those are just some of the issues that we face when dealing with scrapbooks, especially this type. Mm. And they often come to us in varying states. <laughs> some are well preserved, uh, some are in pristine condition because they have been sequestered and away from exposure to the elements. Others have survived by happenstance mm -hmm. and uh, are not so lucky in their, in their journey. Mm -hmm. So th these scrapbooks are so, uh, so well organized and um, are so uh, amazing because The Music Man was a show that everybody on Broadway predicted would not succeed because Meredith Wilson was an outsider, he was an interloper. And the success of The Music Man went against the grain of what was starting to happen on Broadway with West Side Story and edgier uh, musicals. Mm -hmm. But there was a fundamental truth to what Meredith Wilson created that has made this timeless. All right, and we'll finish up with this one. <laughs> and this is the Dick Boyne now, or Voino, which did we decide? Well, since I never met anyone who's pronounced his name, why don't we say Voino, because that sounds like it's more reasonable. Sounds uh, good to me. Sounds good to me. And in this one, we've already added some acid-free paper to the scrapbook um, to slow down the uh, disintegration of the paper because it's, it's not in very good shape. But tell me how you ran across this, this scrapbook, Michael. Well, the fact that this scrapbook survived is miraculous. And we also have large pages mm -hmm. from another scrapbook that came from the same source. Dick Voino uh, was uh, an executive uh, for DECA Records in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and this documents an earlier part of his life that is now uh, an important part of American music uh, legend. And these scrapbooks came from the estate of Donald Kahn, who was the son of the songwriter Gus Kahn. And Donald Kahn donated a lot of material mm -hmm to our foundation, because Gus Kahn is one of the major American songwriters. After Donald's death, his wife invited me over to the house to go through and pull things for our songbook archive. And I was able to find a number of things that are here that are fantastic. However, as carefully as I thought I had canvassed the house, I must have missed a number of things, because Mrs. Kahn sold the house and moved, and through a series of coincidences, I was contacted by a guy who said he had some stuff related to music that he thought maybe I'd be interested in. He was trying to sell it. I said, where did you get this stuff? He explained to me he went to a garage sale in Beverly Hills, and it was raining, and he found all this stuff spread out on a lawn and bought these things for like $100, a bunch of stuff. So when I saw these things, I couldn't believe that I had missed them because these artifacts that somehow survived being spread out on a, a lawn mm -hmm. in the rain uh, are here. Mm -hmm. And the Wolverine Orchestra, which was started by Dick Voino, included in its members the legendary Bix Beiderbecke, who many of you may know is connected to Hoagy 
Carmichael in the history of Jeanette Records, an important part of Indiana musical history, an American popular song, and the history of jazz. He's one of the fundamental figures in jazz. And so these uh, artifacts document the creation of the Wolverines Orchestra with newspaper clippings and ephemera that fill in the gaps of the history and the story of the Wolverines. And also on the other pages, we have snapshots of Bix Beiderbecke, one or two of which have never been seen, and the other two which have been reprinted and seen over and over again in horrible quality. And we have the original mm -hmm. photographs. So this is, this is like finding the lost ark in the history of jazz music. Mm -hmm. and, and somehow these things were meant to survive. Right. And so now we're taking very good care of them. <laughs> Trying to, yeah. So great, thank you. That's a you. I didn't know about the Donald Kahn connection. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you. I wanted to take just a minute and talk about the scrapbooks that we have in our collection. Uh, this is one of many that we have here. Um, this is the Sammy Davis Jr. scrapbook that he created. Uh, when he was inducted into the Kennedy Center Honors. Um, what we will do when we process this um, scrapbook is remove the materials from inside of it. Um, we'll keep the binder itself, but it will be housed separately. And the materials inside will go in acid-free folders. We'll house this separately because the materials that make up this scrapbook, the plastics, the wood, uh, pulp, those materials will off-gas, and that means that those chemicals will start to break down, and over time they can damage the papers and the photos um, that are in the scrapbook. So we want to keep them separate, but still keep them together. One of the projects that we've been working on uh, for several years now is to digitize many of the materials in the uh, Meredith Wilson collection. Uh, one of those projects centered on digitizing um, some of the some of the scrapbooks that we have here, um, page by page, actually. And here I have the Music Man scrapbook, uh, the first one. Meredith had several because the show was such a hit. Um, but we work with vendors who digitize these, and then we make them accessible online through um, Indiana University and through other formats as well. So um, stay with us and keep watching, and you'll see more about these digitization projects. Thanks. Thank you kindly for exploring the archives with us. It was a lot of fun being with you. To learn more about our preservation efforts, please visit thesongbook.org slash archives. We look forward to seeing you again. See you in the movies. Bye.